Okay. <coughs> dear members of the Croatia Association, dear colleagues and dear friends, would like to welcome you to this evening Croatia talk, the second one in the year 2016. I'm very happy to see that, that many of you found the way here in the second floor of the building. Aside the fact that the program has slightly changed, as you might have noticed, so as you have seen from the original flyer that all of you received, there was originally a planned talk about the Earth's magnetic field from Professor Hermann Lühr, but unfortunately Professor Lühr informed us just a couple of weeks ago that he will not be able to come to return this evening. But due to health reasons, so he would really have liked to love to speak to you about his research, magnetic field research, and the latest results of the SWAR mission. But unfortunately, this was not possible, and I'm really more than happy and have to thank a lot to Nick Thomas that he stepped in on such a really, really short notice. As you might know, scientists are usually very busy, and it's not that easy <coughs> to find a substitute in such a short time. And therefore, we can be very grateful that we will have, I guess, a spectacular and fantastic evening tonight with Nick Thomas that will speak about his research, it's not magnetic field, I guess, but we will see, <laughs> about Cassis, the camera going to Mars. So before, but now coming to Nick's talk, of course, I have to introduce him despite the fact that you all know him excellently, I guess. But nevertheless, he was so kind to give me his CV and I would just like to read a couple of points in his career, which is a very impressive one, of course. <laughs> so, as you might have noticed, Nick is British. So, he has studied... Well... well <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it had to be this joke, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Looking at our meeting before. No, so he studied at the University of York, where he did his PhD studies between 82 and 86, at the Department of Physics and graduated with a thesis entitled Studies of Joe and Satellite Io. Then he moved on to the Max Planck Institute for Aeronomy, where he got a postdoctoral research grant from the Max Planck Gesellschaft to work on the analysis of data returned by the Halley multicolor camera on board of ESA spacecraft Giotto. He was involved in this project from 1986 until 1991, where the contract was renewed. And afterwards, he moved on to ESTEC, as I learned here, as an ESA postdoctoral research fellowship between 1991 and 1992. He then returned to his original position at Max Planck Institute for Aeronomy and got there a staff position between 1992 and 2003 when he eventually was elected as a professor here at the University of Chicago <coughs> at the Physikalisches Institute, where he is still active until today and leading the institute since 2015 as the director of the institute. So it's a large entity and a lot of interesting things that are ongoing. There's a long list of involvements that Nick has been doing. I would not like to read all of them, just maybe highlight one of the awards that he got. He got the COSPAR award for Commission B, uh, that's the studies on Earth's moon system, planets and small bodies of the solar system in recognition of his contributions to planetary and cometary science, in particular the analysis of the Giotto. 
images, of course, of the comet Halley. And as an aside, because I found it very funny to read, there's even an asteroid called after Nick Thomas. This asteroid, just in case you would be interested, it's 13,699, so nice number. <laughs> so I think with this preparatory work, we are all curious to know now what is ongoing in the terms of exploration of Mars. So this camera goes to Mars, please. The stage is yours. All right. <laughs> And we try actually before to do under pressure on the queen. Status of the mission and the and the instrument actually is. And I think you'll find that it's quite fun. So let's begin by the basic thesis behind the reason for sending a camera to orbit Mars. The principal reason for doing it is that we've actually discovered over the past, I would say, 10 to 15 years, that Mars is actually a very dynamic planet. There's a lot of stuff going on. The processes that are involved that are going on uh, on the surface are wide ranging, and it's much more active than I think we would have suspected 40 years ago, for example. Um, I'd just like to make here a little list of some of the things that I find particularly interesting. Um, in particular, we're noticing, for example, that there are impacts that are going on. We have meteorites striking the surface of the Earth. Well, guess what? They start the surface of Mars as well. And they have, they make some influence. They have influence on the surface of the planet. And we can see that. Um, we also have very probably aqueous processes going on, um, meaning almost certainly connected to water and brines, in fact, on the surface of Mars. We also have ice accumulation and sublimation, um, not merely water ice in this particular case, but also carbon dioxide ice, particularly our cat. We also have wind activity, uh, aerial activity, uh, dunes blowing around the surface, and I'll show you an example of that in a few seconds. Are we going to be able to get this right, Salima? It's kind of annoying, isn't it? How about that? Does this work better? No. no. <laughs> Come on. Ah, it's my fault. Does this work? Is this better? Is this better? Okay. I'm not too sure about that. It's kind of better. Um, try this again. I have to keep talking because I don't know. we didn't have these problems with electromagnetic compatibility on cassis, I can show you. <laughs> and yet another EMI war. Okay. Oh, that, that's. No, Okay, is that better? Is that better? Do I need a mic? Okay. Have you got 
I've got it for the it's up to that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll test it. You, you test it? So I take this off? Okay, so we have to <coughs> this way. All right. Um, I was just trying to point out that there are a number of active processes that are going on on the surface of Mars that we now know about. So there are current impacts, meteorite impacts onto the surface, exposing ices below the surface. We have aqueous, what we think are aqueous processes going on. Thank you, Samina. Uh, connected to brines on the surface. We have ice accumulation. Ice is being carbon dioxide ice accumulating at the poles during winter, but also connected to water ice. We also have wind activities. We also have dynamic processes associated with gullies. Um, so flows uh, resulting from uh, collapse of mass wasting processes. <clears throat> we also have the possibility that there are hydrothermal processes going on there, possibly, and possibly even current volcanism, although that is possibly that's pushing it a little bit at the present time. Let's just take a couple of examples of this and see what, what's, uh, uh, just give a couple of examples of what these things might be like. Um, this is a, a really nice observation that was obtained from the northern hemisphere of Mars in the northern lowlands. But what it's showing is the presence of recent impacts on the surface. And what's happened is that these impacts, you've had a meteorite coming in, it's hit the atmosphere, it's exploded, and it's gone into bits on the surface. And when it's impacted the surface, it's exposed something underneath the surface. That's water ice. Okay. And uh, you can see here that it's in a couple of places. We used the uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter camera high rise to go and take a look at those spots. And we could monitor them gradually disappearing, the bright stuff gradually disappearing with time, either through sublimation processes, which is one, one possibility that, it's, uh, that was, uh, was the case, or it's been covered up by the dust activity. There's a lot of dust in the Martian atmosphere, and eventually it deposits sediments. And, and covers up the material as well. In fact, in Bern, we got so interested in that that we uh, decided to do a couple of models of that. Andreas Reufer, who was Willie Benz's student, came up to me and said, hey, I can model that. I said, great, get on with it. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm going to try and see this works here. So, oh no, don't do that. Okay. Yeah, so what he did here was that he. he what he did was that he um, he's modeled the surface of Mars as having a thin layer of about 30 centimeters deep of dust. Okay, dusty material. In fact, because of the equation of state, he used a particular material called dunite. And underneath it, he had a large ice layer. Okay, underneath it. And then he had his meteorite impact coming in, blowing a great big hole in it. The thing that I find really amusing is that you can see here that there are pressure waves that are generated along the, along the, uh, along the layers here. But what was really interesting was the total peak pressure that you could see because of this impact. And it turns out that this pressure, when it goes red, exceeds one gigapascal. That pressure is enough to turn the ice material into a fluid, into a liquid. And so it's possible through these impacts to generate, for a relatively short time, liquid on the surface of Mars. Okay. Mm. One fun thing. Here's another fun thing. In 2011, Alfred McEwen, together with some support from, from us in, in Bern, identified these remarkable structures going across the surface. Um, these things, they grew with time during the spring through to midsummer. And then as the sun started to go around to get to so that we were coming into winter, these things would stop growing and they would gradually fade away. And then the following, the following spring, late spring, early summer, hey presto, back they came again. 
And in fact, here's an example here from Newton Basin, where you can see these structures growing with time. It was good. And the only explanation that we could find for that was that this was somehow connected to a liquid. Now, because the temperatures are relatively cold, rarely getting above zero degrees centigrade, the idea was that this had to be water, but it had to be salt water, it had to be a brine. Okay. This has now become a massively hot topic. There are papers being published on this theme regularly. Also, how to depress the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the transition temperature of water to try to get it, uh, try to get the ice to, to become liquid at lower and lower temperatures. In the lab, they're able to do it with particular, with perchlorates. They're actually able to make water liquid at minus 90 degrees centigrade. But of course, you have to have exactly the right mixture. It's got to be exactly like that. No, there's no way in a million years it's going to be like that on Mars. Right? But nonetheless, you can depress the temperature, as we all know, actually, uh, in such a way that you can get uh, water flowing on Mars under the current conditions. So this, at least, is still being investigated in great detail. Um, here's a fun one. I always like to put a presentation, put something like this in one of my talks about Mars when we're talking to Swiss people because this stuff's referred to as Swiss cheese. <laughs> uh, straight out of the Amazon. Yeah, um, question, how large, how large is that? How many kilometers in the Which one? For, this, for these yeah, guys? For this one and for the other one. Okay, for these guys, if we just go back to this. These uh, the lengths of these things are typically five, five to thirty meters. You know, five to thirty. Okay. There's very high resolution energy. You're absolutely right. I haven't got a scale bar. And these guys are rather similar because what? Whoops. Let's go back. This stuff is called Swiss cheese. It's it's uh, um, it's carbon dioxide in the polar in the southern polar regions. And what you're seeing here is that with time. Your Swiss cheese, the holes in your Swiss cheese are getting bigger okay, due to sublimation processes. Right? And high rise is, it has such high resolution that you're actually able to see that happening with time. And so you can see that our Swiss cheese here is getting bigger and bigger as the stuff sublimes and uh, goes up into the goes up into the Martian atmosphere. And then we've got dunes, alien activity. And you can see here that uh, with the high-rise instruments on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, we've been able to monitor dune motion. These things, they creep along the surface with time. Not very fast, okay? Five meters a year, maybe. But sure enough, you can see them moving. Things are more dynamic on the planet than perhaps that we thought of 20, 30 years ago. Then we've got these gullies. We have lots of... Oops. I keep pressing the wrong button. We have lots of gullies here on the surface of Mars, and sometimes these things, due to the thermal contraction and the uh, heating cooling cycles, you can have collapse of these gullies, and you can see flows. You can see the material flowing downhill as a direct result of this. And these gullies, they may, to some, may be in some cases related to water. But most, most, uh, most of the time, they're dry flows, as a matter of fact. But nonetheless, you have changes that are going on on the surface with time. And finally, we have things like that. Uh, this is a piece of work that was done by uh, Uni Baird Postdoc, Patrick Russell. And uh, what we could see with high rise, it just so happened that exactly the time when our camera was going directly over the, over the site, we saw an avalanche. Okay. This is material, there's a steep slope here, and there's material that's come down, and you can see the cloud of material <coughs> generated as the material has fallen off the slope and collapsed onto the surface. Okay. Um, this is not a, a single event. When one was found, they went around and had a look for other ones. And sure enough, in the one season, they found five avalanches. And you've really got to appreciate how, how surprising this is. The high rise camera has a swath width of only six kilometers. 
And that avalanche has got to occur at exactly the time that the spacecraft orbiting the surface, okay, at its four kilometers a second rate, that avalanche has to occur at exactly the time in order to be able to image that. And showing here, of course, because of that, because of the number that we see, it's indicating that you've got a lot more of these avalanches going on all the time. You've got, it's, it's active. And you can see even afterwards, you don't even have to look at the avalanche, you can also look at the, what's, what it's left behind. The nice example here, complete with a scale bar here, of 70 meters across, where, where you've had the failure of a cliff has occurred, and material has, has effectively gone away. It lost. And finally, the other thing that, that has not really been looked at extensively by uh, the previous Mars orbiters is the fact that we have a lot of diurnal processes that go day night, day night processes. Um, you can see, for example, in this particular image, I kind of like this image a lot because it was taken by Rosetta, as a matter of fact, about six days before the uh, six days before its Mars encounter, and you can see here lots of hazy material in the atmosphere. It's got cloudy above directly above the morning turn. That's just indicating to us as well that there are there's a lot of diurnal processes that are going on in the atmosphere, but also on the surface. You can have condensation occurring during the night, generating surface frosts. And most of the previous images have been looking at Mars at, in, during the afternoon period, at three o'clock in the afternoon local time. They're in some synchronous orbits. So um, what, they, what, uh, what we don't see because of that is that we don't see, for example, surface frosts that are built up during the, during the night because we're not observing in the mornings. So now, all of those processes might be involved in this particular observation. Any of those things could be involved in the process that puts methane into the atmosphere of Mars. Now, methane was first detected by the Venus, uh, by, the Mar no, by, the, by the Mars Express spacecraft, the PFS instrument on, on Mars Express, in a famous paper by Formisano et al. Now, this paper and this detection has been controversial for many years. And in fact, ground-based observations have made an effort to try to detect this methane in the atmosphere. And Mike Mummer came up with this observation where he could try to find the methane abundance in the Martian atmosphere and, can, and found in specific areas values at the level of 30 parts per billion. But sometimes it was there, sometimes it wasn't. Well, why is that important? Well, methane actually has a very short lifetime in the Martian atmosphere, typically 50 years or so there or thereabouts. So the fact that methane is there is indicating there must be a production mechanism. Now, what could a production mechanism be? Well, we all think about immediately about biology. At least that's what a lot of people want you to think. Because there are other mechanisms. Volcanism is one possibility. If you've got active volcanism, methane comes out of volcanoes. Um, but you've also got other things. We've seen, for example, that there's ice, and ice being exposed from time to time. That ice might have trapped methane in the past, and then suddenly it's released. Okay. And that might lead, for example, to the, the fact that it's not constantly there. It's not being released continuously, but it seems to be episodic. Anyway, immediately after the discovery of methane, and because of this controversy, ESA decided that it was going to, with its orbiter for the ExoMars mission, that it was going to emphasize looking for trace gases. They do their best these days not to talk about methane because, you know, well, you never quite know, did it? So this was how the ExoMars trace gas orbiter was born as part of the ExoMars program. 
Now, the ExoMars lander and rover is now scheduled to land on the surface of Mars in 2020. But the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter has just been launched on 14th of March. Now, we were invited to put a camera on that in support of the trace gas experiments that are dedicated to looking for trace gases in the Martian atmosphere. So this is the mission overview, the basic, really top level objectives of the 2016 ExoMars mission, which has now become, become called the Trace Gas Orbit. It has one major technological objective. Um, it's to try to demonstrate that Europe can put an entry, descent, and landing system on a Mars spacecraft and get it successfully down onto the surface. That was its main technological objective. But it also has scientific objectives, and the science objectives were to study the Martian atmosphere of trace gases and their sources, as I've just alluded to. And also using the lander to try to conduct some surface environmental measurements. If you've got a lander, you might as well use it. Put something on there to measure the atmospheric uh, sort of pressure, temperature, and so on and so forth. And finally, to provide data relay services for lander missions through until 2022, including the rover. This is what the payload currently looks like. We have the trace gas uh, observing instruments NOMAD, led by uh, the Royal Observatory in Belgium, uh, uh, Royal Observatory in Brussels in Belgium, NOMAD instrument. It's a bunch of infrared spectrometers. The Russian team has also a suite of high resolution spectrometers referred to as ACS. Once again, looking at atmospheric chemistry, again, chasing trace gases. There's also from Russia an instrument called FRIEND, which is a neutron detector. The idea here is that we know that there's water ice under the surface of Mars. And there seems to be quite a lot of it. In some places, in the first meter below the surface, there's something like 14% of water okay, that we know about coming from previous neutron spectrometer observations. This thing, however, is going to do it at much higher resolution. Okay. And with luck, will I localize water ices far better uh, than the previous, previous missions. And finally, there's this thing. Okay. This is Cassis. It's a high resolution stereo camera. So what are the top level science objectives for Cassis? Firstly, which is intended to characterize sites which have been identified as potential sources of trace gases. That's one of our basic tasks. Ideally, Nomad or ACS will say, hey, look here. There's lots of methane going on down here. Look down there and see if there's a cow. Right. Uh, it's one of our main jobs. But also, we want to investigate dynamic surface phenomena. So I tried to allude to the earlier. And finally, we've also got a job to do, which is to try to certify potential future landing sites as <laughs> high a resolution as we can by characterizing local slopes, rocks, and other potential hazards. So now let's talk a little bit about the instrument itself. Um, I'd just like to begin by how did it all start? How the heck did Switzerland get to PI a camera <coughs> on this mission? And it really comes about for historical reasons. Originally, ExoMars was a joint NASA ESA mission. And indeed, NASA put out in 2010, they put out an announcement of opportunity for payload for the Trace Gas Orbiter. I happened to be on sabbatical at the University of Arizona at the time. And Alfred McEwen, who is the PI of the high-rise instruments on Martin Thomas's orbiter, came up to me and said, hey, Nick, do you think we should propose for this? I said, well, I think we possibly should. And so we put together a proposal in such a way that, in fact, we in Switzerland became responsible 
just for the telescope. Okay. The idea being that I would give a contract to Ruag in Zurich, okay, that they could build the telescope for us, and we ship it off to the States, we integrate it all together, and we have a joint program to observe the surface of Mars. That was the basic idea. Uh, but then something happened. That happened. In 2012, NASA was forced to pull out. Um, in some places, we don't really know uh, quite why or how this all came about. Um, I happen to know that the Mars Exploration Program at NASA headquarters was actually really, really supportive and really wanted to go ahead and do it. But somebody above their pay grade decided that this wasn't going to work or that they didn't want to play. And so in 2012, uh, NASA was forced to, forced to pull out. So there were some phone calls that were made and in various places. And the first thing that happened was that ESA got into bed with the Russians. Okay? So that ESA and Roscosmos decided that they were going to try and reach an agreement and they, they were going to do the probe. But that didn't solve the camera problem because the Russians, they were quite clear to me, they said, we don't have the technology to build a high resolution camera to fly to Mars. See, you need another partner. So the Swiss Space Office really worked incredibly hard, and I really want to make it uh, make it plain here that how hard those guys actually worked in order to try to make something happen. And they helped us to put together a consortium where we would get a detector system from Italy, we'd get the power converter from Poland, and the University of Bern would lead the rest. And we would put the whole instrument together here in Bern. That's how it came about. Now, it took a little while in order to get all of that together. And it left us with a very little time in order to get the instrument functionally working. Uh, but that's what happened. That was our celebration when we realized that, yes, we were going to be given the go-ahead and go ahead and do it. Um, that's Tracy over there. <laughs> okay. um, we were actually in Santa Fe, New Mexico, when the Swiss Space Office called us up and said, we think we have a deal, let's go, let's do it. Okay. But this was only less than two years before we had to deliver the instrument. It wasn't much time. It's me, of course, drinking margaritas. <laughs> <laughs> I don't let PhD students drink hard alcohol. <laughs> Okay, so what were the key driving requirements? Well, the biggie, the, the real ghost in the room was the shape. We actually only had about 23 months to build, uh, which for most spacecraft instrumentation, as many of you will know, is verging on the ridiculous. Um, so we had to cut corners. And we did that by using a spare primary mirror because the, uh, the delivery time on some of these mirrors and we needed a mirror that's about this big, okay? Space qualified, space space qualified coatings and so on. The delivery time that we were looking at was 14 months if we built it from scratch. So we couldn't deal with that, so we had to use a spare from another program. The other thing that we had to do was to take uh, a detector and proximity electronics from a team that were already already had some. And so what we did was that we used the flight spare from the Beppe Colombo camera system symbiosis provided to us by the Italians. What else did we do? Well, we also had limited mass and volume. And so once again, we had to figure out a, a really clever way of optimizing the optical design in such a way that we could get it inside the mass and volume requirements that we had. And we also had to use this symbiosis detector it has um, a set of filters that are directly on top of the, the, detector, the, excuse me, the detector. And we had to replace those. And so we had to get ourselves a new filter mask and make that work, um, which was actually not as trivial as it sounds. 
And then the other thing that we really wanted to do was to generate stereo. That was one of the things that we really wanted to do uh, because we thought that this is really where some of the high, high volume, high, high quality science is going to come from. And so in order to do that, we had to implement a rotation mechanism. The idea is the following. We basically, we're running around the surface of Mars at an altitude of about 400 kilometers. And this is where we get to do the little cassis dance. All right? Because what we do is instead of looking directly straight downwards in the Nadir direction, we're actually slightly off pointed. We point 10 degrees in front. Okay? So now we're going off in front like this, taking a picture. And then we turn around. And you get the same point from two different directions with a convergence angle of 22 degrees. Okay? And that's the reason why we need this rotation mechanism that's connected to these that's on it. There's also another slight problem about the solar panels of the spacecraft because the solar panels all have to point to the sun all the time. And so, actually, what the spacecraft does is that it's doing this all the time and turning all the time. So, we use the rotation mechanism to compensate for that as well. This is the little cassis dance. I expect you all to be in the disco this evening doing the cassis dance. I'm going to turn this to a trap. Okay, good. So, but basically, do we have enough time to do that? Well, it turns out that we did. It puts some constraints on the rotation mechanism. But in fact, we've got about, about 47 seconds to complete this rotation. And so being a good person, taking good margins, um, I told the engineers we need 15 seconds in the hope that they would do 30. Uh, and, you know, whoops, and you know what? Not merely did they, uh, not merely did they beat 30, they also got very close to 15 seconds as well, actually. They did a hell of a job on that, just do that. So yes, this is what the instrument uh, optical design looks like. It's a four mirror system. It's a three mirror and a stick mat system off axis in order to reduce stray light, but it's, it's got a little bit of power on this last mirror, which is kind of unusual for these types of optical systems. And the reason for that is purely to reduce the size of this guy here, because otherwise it would have broken our volume requirements. So that's the reason for this guy there. And then that's what it actually looks like. We put out a contract to Rueck in Seebach to, to build us the telescope. And they did a really super job in delivering the, delivering the instrument on time. It's a carbon fiber structure altogether. They have, a, have an excellent heritage in carbon fiber reinforced polymers. Um, it's got a 13.5 centimeter M1. Uh, focal length is 880 millimeters. Uh, for those of you who love the Rosetta images of the nucleus of Carl Howard, um, this thing has higher resolution because we have a longer focal length. So in principle, we get sharper, I would say higher resolution images than on the Rosetta. Um, and then in connection to this, we stick on the focal plane assembly the folk, this is what the focal plane assembly looks like, and that comes from Italy. It's the uh, symbiosis uh, focal plane assembly uh, delivered to us by Selex uh, from Campi Vicenzio in the world. Um, this is the filter mask that we had to have made. Uh, we went and had it done in Balsas in Vienna, uh, and uh, you can see here the different processes that are involved in generating masks and so on. The reason is the following. The system itself is what's referred to as a push frame system. So now you get the second part of the cassis dance. Because what we do is you take individual frames very rapidly, okay, in all colors simultaneously, and you overlap them. So what you do is that you're doing this, right? And then you go, do, 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 do. Okay, those are the frames that you're taking. And then after the fact, when you get all the data down on the ground, you stitch them all together to produce one, per hopefully, perfect image of the surface of Mars in all colors. Mm -hmm. 
That's what it actually looks like on top of the detector once it's been replaced and put on top. The detector itself is a 10 micron pixel, uh, 10 micron squared pixel uh, uh, CMOS array, 2K by 2K, produced by Raytheon in the United States. Um, what else can I say about that? It's basically CMOS technology, it's a hybrid CMOS device. And then we can generate blue, near infrared, red, and panchromatic. Um, we have certain masks here. You can see here that it's black in the middle here. Okay? And that's basically to prevent crosstalk from occurring between the different filters. Uh, so you don't want light bouncing around all over the place, uh, contaminating one filter with an, uh, photons from one filter with another. And so we have these black masks in the center to, to, to do that. And then we get the signal to noise through typical exposure. So if we use uh, a dark part of Mars. Mars has a lot of, uh, a lot of different uh, brightnesses on the surface. You can the polar caps, you've got a lot of things. It's bright, it's 60% reflected. So, but for our signal to noise calculations, we try to use dark Mars. Uh, incidence angle, solar incidence angle is about 45 degrees. We have, because we're traveling so fast over the surface, our exposure times are very short, 1.5 milliseconds. Uh, and you can see that in our panchromatic channel, we can get signals and noises in excess of 170. So that's pretty good stuff. And what can we use those color filters to do? Well, we can generate, we can I try even to identify different minerals on the surface with the camera system. Okay? And so what you've got here are the ratios of the filters. So this is the near infrared divided by the blue against the panchromatic camera divided by the, uh, divided also by the blue system. And you can see here the different minerals that you can separate just by looking at the ratios on this uh, color color plot. So we recognize here hematite, iron oxide, goatite, and so on. And we also have sensitivity here, taking again blue divided by near IR uh, uh, against pan divided by near IR. And what you can see here, you can separate jarosite, which has now been known to be on the surface of Mars from the uh, Curiosity. Uh, observations, uh, serpentines, other beans, and so on and so on. So in fact, it turns out, and there's, there's a guy in Canada, Livio Tornabene, who uh, who's working with us. He got some money from the Canadian Space Agency to help us. And uh, he's been doing a lot of this work, taking the observations that we made here and uh, producing plots like this. So now, some pretty pictures of some hardware, some shiny hardware. First of all, um, this is the this is one of the pieces, one of the major pieces that, that Uni Baum built. So we have here the structure on which everything is mounted. It's kind of a T-shaped -stru structure. So you have the telescope is cantilevered off this side of the instrument, and it's balanced by a couple of things that are kind of interesting. Um, you, the rotation mechanism is housed inside this structure here. The structure itself is extremely light, and it's made out of albumin. Um, and inside there is the proximity electron, so the detector is inside that bearing. And because we're doing a lot of rotations, we have this thing hanging off the left hand side here. What is that? It's a cable management system. Right. You've got all these bloody cables. Well, you don't want to ruin them around and wrap this stuff up. I don't know about you, but I, get, I can't even watch television without cables getting wrapped up. Okay, getting in a mess. This <coughs> is supposed to happen. You can see where the cable, where the, the, the connectors come out to take it to the uh, uh, take it down to the electronics unit. Um, this was mostly done at the University of Bern. Almost all of this. Um, we've also got a, a, an interface plate that's designed here just to get us away from the spacecraft deck, because the spacecraft deck, you know, is totally undefined as usual. You know? We tell you about these bloody these spacecraft guys. <laughs> what is that? We want to be isolated from you guys. Um, so that's that's sitting here, and this is in the lab where the when the telescope, the right telescope, is mounted to the rotation mechanism. Um, that's a little close up of the cable management system. Um, just to show you some of the fine elements that go into this, um, look at the size of the fingers here. Um, 
This is actually one of the end stops because there's something else that you don't want to happen either. You don't want to command a rotation and it just keeps on going, right? Okay. So that's the reason why we have one of these things. That's an end stop. So that as soon as you get to it, oh, I've got to stop before you wreck, before you destroy it. It's one of the end stops. It's a really nice, nice bit of hardware. You can just see how big it is. Um, and then, of course, there's electronics. Um, we always show diagrams like these and pictures like these. Um, nobody understands it, of course, <laughs> all right? But incredibly important, uh, of course, in order to make everything work. Um, we have here a uh, power converter, for example. That came in from Poland, the Space Research Center of Warsaw having this one. Uh, but these two boards were made. This is the rotation, this is the board that controls the rotation mechanism, this is the digital processing. And uh, we were totally amazed that the very first time that we plugged everything together, it worked. <laughs> we were totally amazed. Um, Staggered. Uh, either we were, uh, I have to say, in some cases, we're probably very, very lucky indeed. Okay, and then the whole thing is integrated. Here's the electronics box, all of those boards go into this thing. And uh, this is uh, this Cloudy, actually, who's uh, uh, connecting everything up. And that's, that's what it looks like when it was integrated. And then, of course, you have to put it on the shaker tape. So you can take a look at that. You'll see some people's feet around here, because Ruth's feet are over here. Is that you? Is that you? <laughs> but they stay stationary. Now watch that. See that? <laughs> That's, uh, that's the instrument going through the resonance frequency, and it's very close to the frame rate of the video camera that we took, and that's the reason why you see it doing that. Right? Cool. So we didn't want to give me sound because you know, I thought I was going to scare everybody. <coughs> but it shook it and it took it. So we did. And then mounted the multi layer insulation, and so the instrument actually looks like that on the spot. All nice and black. And then we tested the rotation mechanism. Um, I don't have pictures of Vicky who's sitting down here who's looking at him going, yeah. <laughs> uh, but there's the rotation mechanism showing in the room. I do have to say that we got that rotation mechanism working six weeks before delivery for the first time. Uh, we were cutting it very, very fine. It was very, very fine. Okay, and then on the 14th of March, that happened. Um, this is my video. I took this one. <laughs> so you'll see that the rocket goes out of picture because I'm not a professional. Uh, but, uh, that's the proton launch on the 14th of March. Whoops. Where's it gone? Oh, there it is. <laughs> hey, come back. Right, boom, gone. Right. So yeah, just <laughs> I don't really know why I put this in, but just simply to say that um, when we designed the thing, um, effectively a fraction over two and a half years ago, we had some numbers that we were trying to calculate and just make estimates about this, and what the instrument would look like and what it would be like, and we ended up getting very, very close. To what we uh, the, the build was ended up with an instrument that was very close to what we were designed to. Um, and uh, you know, it's uh, in the end, it looks as if it's going to deliver some great images. The other thing that I calculated the other day is that you saw those lovely pictures from high rise right at the beginning of the talk. Right? 
Now, high rise will beat us in terms of resolution. High rise is a monster of an instrument. You really must appreciate this. It's 65 kilograms, cost more than 50 million bucks, and that was more than 10 years ago. It's a pig of a thing, right? It's huge. You see a guy standing next to it, and the camera's this big. Right? It's huge. But there's one thing where we do beat it on, and that's the fact that we managed to get quite a lot of signal through the instrument. It's been designed so that we would actually get more signal through the instrument than high rise. So that, in fact, our signal to noise should be 50% better than high rise. So even though we don't do it at high resolution, we will manage to do, we will manage to get higher signal to noise. And I'm fairly confident that we've calibrated the instrument a lot better than high rise. High rise has got some issues with calibration, with photometric calibration. And for us, I think we can see this is not the case. We've really had it, had it pretty good. So we can see here that this A only product ratio here tells us that we should have about 53% more signal uh, in the system per pixel. Now, what do we do? Well, the mass, it's only 18 kilos. It's not a big experiment. Um, the average power we consume is about 17 watts. When the rotation mechanism is whizzing around, uh, we go up to about 56 watts of oil there about in the cold case. Uh, but basically, uh, it's well within the requirements that are given to us by ESA. And that was one of our first full sensor images of the night sky after launch. And when you blow everything up, you can find a star. And when you look at that star, you can see that the instrument is in focus. We only have 1.27 pixels, full width half maximum. We were scared stiff about that. Because one thing you really don't want is Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> you remember? Yeah. It's one thing you really don't want. It scares you to death. And Antoine Pomerol and myself, we had a lot of issues with this about making sure that it was right. And uh, you could see the stone falling from Antoine's heart when we realized <laughs> the thing actually worked. So that's an actual star image that was acquired on the 7th of April in Florida. And in fact, we were actually able to monitor how Gulag's telescope was performing as a function of temperature. It was designed to, to be perfectly operative, fully functional, at 20 degrees centigrade. But when we first boot up the instrument, it's still only got survival heaters working. So in fact, the instrument is sitting at about minus 25 the telescope. So you have to warm it up. But sometimes we took some pictures when the instrument was not warm. And you could see that it wasn't in focus. It started up at a cold temperature, the point spread function is quite large. And then gradually, as you bring it up to temperature, the point spread function goes boom. Okay? And you end up with a very sharp, a very sharp image. And that was really nice. And you know something? There's a little trick that we're thinking about doing. There's this damn lander, this entry descent and lander system, right? It's even got a name, it's called Scaparelli. Now, normally, if you have a high-resolution camera, you're not in focus in the near field. Typically, you have to be 10, 20, 30 kilometers away before the instrument is really in focus. Right? Anything that's really close, you can't see. But it turns out that if we're at minus 20 degrees centigrade with the telescope, we actually come near sighted. <laughs> and it's a possibility to use that to get a sharper image of a damn lander when it goes <laughs> off. <laughs> I don't think he's in there. Um, of course, that'll be the last that we see of it before it crashes on the surface. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've been able to manage to get lots and lots of stars. We can see stars down to mag magnitude 12 or there or there or there, so the in about two seconds exposure time. We can identify them and so on and so forth. But it's basically indicating the instrument's fully functional. And in the end, we'll be able to take full color, full stereo in swaths this big compared to what high rise can do. High rise just gets color in a little tiny area there in the middle, 
we do full color in four colors, they just do it in three, and we do it in a much larger suite. Um, so we'll be looking at all those things that I tried to show you right at the beginning uh, of the talk in all of these uh, in, uh, in full color and full stereo. So I tried, I tried to see, this is cheating actually. <laughs> I shouldn't even really show you this, but it's cheating. Um, this is a high rise image showing this, these brines going on. And um, Rami Omari, one of the post ups and down, he, he tried to simulate this. And um, you, you, you know, you claim here that you can see these things just as well as you can see them here. It's cheating a little bit because you know, it hasn't quite got the principle of function included in it as well. It will be a little bit worse than that. But nonetheless, it's giving you an indication that you do have a chance of being able to see these blind flows as well using this. So now, what happens next? Well, on Monday and Tuesday next week, we have mid cruise checkout one. All right, so we've programmed up the observations to do that. Uh, looks like this, and here it is. This is uh, Cassis on day 165 at 9:51 Universal Time. Okay, next week. All right, and switch on, and we start start with our procedures, taking images as well. And with a bit of luck, we might even get our first image of Mars. It won't be very spectacular. Uh, because it's still only about 15 pixels across, so it won't be, won't be, won't be anything fancy. And don't forget, though, we've still got three months to go before we get to the <clears throat> uh, But after that, then, we release and say goodbye to Schiaparelli, the entry descent and land lander system. Uh, then on the 19th of October, <laughs> we've got Mars orbit insertion. At the same time, Schiaparelli crashes on the system. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I shouldn't have said so. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of people that have a lot of work to try to make that thing work. And it shouldn't be so facetious. Uh, but uh, we have Mars orbit insertion on the 19th. So. Um, we then have about a three month phase where we're in a highly elliptical orbit. It's called, called Mars capture orbit. We'll be taking some images during that period, not too many. Um, uh, he said, doesn't they play also a bit shorter manpower from time to time? Uh, and so they, they don't want to do too much in this sort of but we'll, we'll be getting our first data really from the surface of Mars at that time, and even possibly the highest resolution data uh, because we actually go down to about 200 kilometers over the surface, and so we've got the possibility of getting data down to about 2.5 meters per pixel. And then at the end of January 2017, we start error breaking, which is designed to reduce the size of the orbit and circularize it. And then, in fact, in sometime in September 2017, still not known, we begin actually the prime mission when we go into main operation space. And then, if everything keeps working, who knows where we start. So, there's one thing that um, I just want to share this with you as well, because um, coming from the head of ESA's products office, I think several people in the room really know what about ESA products that they fund. Effectively, they act as uh, Switzerland's space agency. Uh, they give out, make contracts for us, make contracts with industry for us, and so on. Um, these guys, they see a lot of space missions, they see a lot of space instrumentation. So. Um, I'd just like to say here that uh, well, just this quote from Michel Lesage, who's the head of that project's office. So, this project illustrates what it takes to be successful in space projects lots of knowledge, faith in the goal, trust in the team. Perseverance, the drive to fight the naysayers, and the drive to accept risk, although in a thorough way. I think you, I think you check him down to put a full stop there. Because <laughs> <laughs> right, right. um, those are the people that did it. Okay. So these are the Polish guys up here. This is Jakubow Fikai Beltrami. He's from Salex in Capi Byzantio. We have this enormous things of getting the detector and. Uh, uh, try and make everything work. Um, these very stiff guys are the Hungarians. They did our flight software for us. Uh, and they came on board very, very late and they did a super job. In fact, they're still working because the compression is still not finished. We have to up make it this very good. This is the Ruab team uh, who delivered the telescope on time. Um, and my favorite optical engineer here, Tom Swigel. And this is the BAM team. With project manager there. And if you want to keep track of what's happening with Cassis, 
you can take a look at www.cease.mov from the signal, where we've got something uh, where you can take a look and see uh, what's going on. And we've got some videos online uh, on YouTube that you can take a look at as well. And there's the team members. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sure there are questions. I knew you were. <laughs> it's something which has nothing to do with this question, but uh, with the one which uh, the Americans uh, bought in uh, 2010 or something like that. Uh, then uh, it was announced that Israel would go with the Russians to build the uh, exoplanet mission. And a few weeks after that, I read in the, in the literature that the Americans had uh, initiated the Mars 2020 mission. Yes. The way, the usual way the Americans do. <laughs> so what, what is the uh, what is the payload of this Mars 2020? And do you have the camera on Mars 2020, which is the same as yours? All no, right. Uh, uh, they've been looking. There's still science definition teams working on something. But the the next orbiter mission that uh, the Americans are going to do is going to be 2022, I believe. And there is a high-rise camera in the straw man payload. A, well, what they refer to as a high-rise-like camera. So again, they want to go to high resolution here, uh, which I think is correct, because one of the things that's important to recognize is that high-rise is basically only, only looked at something like 3% of the surface. That's also why the Americans are still very interested to work with Cassis, because you know there's plenty of real estate to look at. Um, <laughs> And so and their fear is that high-rise will eventually die. I think some parts of it are, are not as good as they were. A couple of the detectors are no longer working. Um, so you know, they're scared that it's going to die. And then the only game in town is going to be this one, which I don't think they're going to like right So that, that's the status quo. <coughs> questions? Why uh, did you build a, a camera from the ground up not use any this? Are they um, good enough? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> um, there wasn't anything, there wasn't really anything that was of that. You must appreciate that it's, it's probably, it's the second best in terms of, uh, second equal best in terms of resolution. And those things, they're not just sitting there on the shelf. Um, Ruth's very fond of saying that it's the best color stereo camera ever to fly to the Mars, and she's probably right. Um, but the finding things that are just that, that are just sort of lying around there is not not straightforward. I do have to say that we had also we, we tried to look at, at using other parts uh, from the, uh, previous programs that are, that are flying. Um, in, in trying to construct Cassis as well, to try and take advantage of, of previous heritage. So we had a talk, for example, to DLR, um, a couple of guys from DLR, um, we had a talk to DLR about that, uh, because they had an absolutely ideal detector system. Okay? But the problem was that nobody would pay for it. You know, no matter what you do, even if it's lying there, just waiting for you to use, it still has to be, you know, it's got to be re-qualified, it's got to be put together interfaces and all the rest of them. People just weren't prepared to pay for that. That's the reason why we ended up actually going to talk to the town. We did the best that we could actually in, 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 in taking taking an existing system. We might have might have ended up with a sort of someone like a codec against the asset or something. It wouldn't have been much better than that. That's not science. I want to do science. <laughs> Oh. I'm not sure if you mentioned it or not. When does Cassie start to take the first pictures of Mars itself? Well, we've got. Um, it will depend a little bit. Uh, what do you mean by that? The um, next week we get our first image of Mars, but as I say, it's only time. Right? It's going to be 15 pixels across. You can do. You do a factor of 10 better with Hubble Space Telescope, right? Um, but when we get to 
after Mars orbit insertion, we're in this highly elliptical Mars capsule. And we will have the opportunity to take a few images, not many, a few. We won't be able to specify the target. All right? You just get, get what's given to you. Uh, but those have the potential for being very high resolution. And so even the possibility of trying to do some science with those guys. But then once we have to go into error breaking, the orbit gets circularized, and then we're in prime mission, and that will be September of 2017 at the earliest. Do you use uh, different parts from flight, flight spare parts from different other uh, missions? And uh, probably these were baked out before years ago. Did you have to do a re bake out when you collected all these parts? Oh, yeah, there were parts that were done. Um, fortunately, with the, the primary mirror, you don't have to bake out. Um, but the, uh, but the uh, detector and uh, proximity electronics system, for example, there were parts of that that had to be redone. Um, we also had, they had a board uh, for the proximity electronics that came with the detector. And that had to be re, uh, had to be uh, built again and the connectors moved around. And so all of that had to be requalified. It had to be that way because, um, maybe I can just show it. Because I, I think this is kind of interesting as well. It's interesting to show. <clears throat> Yeah, okay, it's not, not so good. I'm gonna, I got that already. I actually have a picture of that. This is the proximity electronics for the detector. And it's actually sitting inside the rotation bearing system, right? Now, you can see here that the rotation bearing is effectively, it's, it's on both sides of the, both sides of the box. And in the original system for Becky Colombo, the connectors came out of those sides. And so I had to redesign it in such a way that the connectors came out the top. And so all of that stuff had to be effectively requalified, shaken, and all the rest of it. So you can't you know, take your stuff and just simply use it very rarely, very rarely. I uh, was very impressed by the one of the first images you showed where you have these three bats uh, on the surface of Mars with uh, ice coming out. Uh, has there been any measurements made of uh, how much water is lost during these impacts? And uh, how much water has been lost by Mars? This is an uh, important way of uh, abandoning water on Mars. I think it's unlikely that it's a way of getting water out of there because the, um, it, it's relatively local. The impact we're talking about here, uh, your, your impact is on the order of 75 kilos or so. So it's much less than dropping a bus on the surface, you know, much less than dropping a car on the surface. And so uh, you, you then produce the water um, and you'll get sublimation from, from the surface. That, that, is not a, the, that escaping material is not at any high velocity. And it simply gets accumulated into the atmosphere. And we know that there's about six precipitable microns of water in the atmosphere. And that will simply transport itself, and eventually it will end up on one of the caps. Okay, what's the sedimentation rate on Mars? Oh, yeah, right, for, for dust particles. Um, that was done, the first measurements of that, and it's the, the one that I find easiest to recall is that Mars Pathfinder measured that on the on uh, on the on that little rover. Do you remember the very first rover called Sojourner yeah, yeah. from 1997? It's a little tiny thing there. Okay. And the, what they had on there was a solar cell with a little window on the top mm -hmm. and a little movable window. And so they measured the sunlight and they put the window across and left it there and so that you could see how much dust was accumulating. Mm -hmm. And they they identified that you would get 25% of the area covered in around about 60 to 70 uh, Martian days, Martian solids. Mm -hmm. right. So you're talking about half a percent, a bit less than half a percent coverage per, per Martian day from dust dropping out of the atmosphere. Now, of course, it gets cleaned as well because you get a, 
Uh, you know, these dust devils going around the place. Yeah, what about that, that the, uh, the dust which the vehicle produces itself? Yeah, and there's also, there's also stuff like that. That was well. accounted for. Yeah, that, that was done. That was done. Mm -hmm. But there are, um, but as I say, you know, you, you, um, you, you've also got dust being mobile mm -hmm. and being, being blown up as well from the, um, mm -hmm. taken up by, uh, by dust devils and the like. Um, but there's also, of course, with the uh, with the sublimation of the of the water ice from these from these surfaces as well, you can also generate a sort of sublimation lag as well. This is not perfectly clear. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You are playing with uh, Scaparelli, yeah. which uh, lands on uh, on the surface of Mars. So yeah. it should be it should be uh, sterilized before going there. I don't know how this has been done. But then, if you are on the same on the same boat, your mission must be also sterilized. How did you do that? Funnily enough, nobody paid any attention to that at all. So yeah, if, sure. bugs, <laughs> if the bugs, you know, yeah, you have the slugs know. crawling away from our instrument, yes, they're crawling onto Scaparelli as well. No, we had no plans. We wouldn't have stood a chance in hell of being able to do the mission. Uh, if that would be the case, it wouldn't, you know, um, it was, was hopeless. The other thing, as well, of course, is that we're full of carbon because the, uh, the, the telescope structure is, uh, is uh, this carbon fiber, and um, you know, the, all of that has to be encapsulated and whatever if you, if you want to put it on scaffold. Uh, but no, it, it was kept separate, and uh, uh, we, we were also very scared about how clean it was really going to be in, in at the proton launch site. Uh, but apparently it was it was very good because we we was, we're always scared about getting crap on our nose, of course. Uh, but so uh, apparently it was much better than was originally predicted. So. But I don't think it's bug free. Yeah, Rafa. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, well, I can only congratulate you, congratulate you, the team for uh, yeah. well done. Uh, I mean, we have been involved in some. Very project matter. I know what it takes really to uh, complete the time because normally making someone and uh, meet performance in such a short time and hopefully also stay on budget. I don't know about the budget, but uh, that's not exactly breathtaking. Thank you, Thank you very good job. I also would like to congratulate you and your team because you have produced a very excellent instrument within a very short time, less than two years. Using a spark, it doesn't matter. But I'm wondering if you were able also to produce a spark model for this. No, no. <laughs> not a chance. No. Did you have some problems with the camera for this test? We don't. Uh, we don't. And in fact, there's, there, there's some things I haven't, I haven't spoken about but that are a bit. Of a concern, um, not not only from not from our side, but also from the spacecraft side. The spacecraft also has some has one or two issues. Um, it's kind of surprising. The spacecraft generates um, huge amounts of housekeeping itself, right? Much more than, than they originally wanted. And one of the things that happens, one of the consequences of this, is that. Um, we only get housekeeping packets from our instrument um, every 120 seconds. Now you can imagine the rotation mechanism is turning in 15 seconds. It, it came very close to meeting the requirement. We have to have a pure luck to determine whether uh, whether the rotation mechanism has, is consuming the correct amount of power. Right. So we don't even know what's going on up top in this respect. Uh, which is kind of scary, uh, and in fact, it's the one reason why, you know, when we're doing these mid-cruise checkouts, uh, there's still, uh, I think, we're still all a little bit, you know, nervy about has that really worked correctly or not? Uh, because in, in some cases, we still don't really know. Up until now, we've been able to prove because there are these end stops and so on, and you can see that the instrument homes correctly, and it's done that correctly, so it seems to be working. But uh, often the devil is in the details, right? Like, and uh, the details we don't know.
any further questions? Oh, yeah. The question of rotation of the instrument means yeah. also that you have to make sure that there is no dust coming into it. Do you take any precautions no. for that? <laughs> no, it's not. No. No, because we have been speaking about the sedimentation rate, which is on winds and aerosol in motion. So you might have yeah, the instrument though is clean and it's now in space. It's not going down to the surface of Mars, so you know we don't care about you know it's not that many dust particles. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a few scientists that would complain about that. But I'm quite happy about it. <laughs> Go ahead. Any lubrication in your moving parts? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, there's some stories about that, uh, <laughs> which I'm not going to talk about in public. <laughs> uh, um, but yes, there, there's. Uh, we actually, in the end, we had to had to put some put some uh, brake grease in there too to make sure that the rotation mechanism would work correctly. Um, but there's uh, uh, basically, I think, you know, when we when we completed the tests and we put it into the thermal vacuum chamber, I took it down to cold temperature. It's still turning. It's, it's, it's okay. It works. Any closing remarks? Questions? <coughs> Everybody's thirsty. <laughs> or came to hear the stories in the public. Now then, thanks again a lot, Nick, for this great talk. Before closing the session, of course, as usual, the announcement or the reminder about the forthcoming talk. So the next Croisi talk will be in October, as you may have seen already. 12th of October, we will have Professor Carsten Danzmann. From the Albert Einstein Institute in Hanover, and he will speak about all the spectacular topic, I guess, about Lisa Pathfinder and the search for gravitational waves. So, this was our original intention. As you all know, in the meantime, there have been spectacular <laughs> discoveries on Earth, on ground, and I'm quite sure Professor Dunsman will elaborate on this as well. So, I hope to see all of you in fall again, and now wish you all a nice number of today, which you are all cordially invited, and thanks again to our speaker.